Good morning, everybody, and hello from foggy Cambridgeshire. I'm Maxine Fakara, I'm CEO at Praxis Oral, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our week of KE Celebration Online. It's absolutely fantastic that we've got 67 organisations participating and nearly 300 delegates registered to attend during the course of the week. So we are definitely setting a new record for the number of KE practitioners attending a conference whilst wearing slippers. Seriously though, we have been truly humbled by the number of individuals who have taken time under extraordinary circumstances to contribute content to share with their KE colleagues in the practice oral community. We've got an exciting week lined up for you. Webinar sessions, panel sessions, interactive chat groups, informal chat spaces, even a KE quiz. So a huge thank you to all those individuals uh, who have uh, taken the time to put these sessions and this entire week together. Kudos too to the exec team behind the scenes who have done all the hard work to bring this event together and to make us all look good online, hopefully. I know that you are all Zoom professionals by now, but let me just explain a little how this is all going to work. So we've designed the schedule this week to allow you to dip in and out of sessions as you wish. The main sessions will run in Zoom webinar and then the interactive sessions will run in Zoom meeting and you, you will be able to transition between these spaces via a dedicated link in the chat during the main session. And the chair of that session will explain what you need to do to get to them, so don't worry. Some of the sessions that you attend uh, will be very interactive via chat and delegate polls, um, but all attendees uh, will have received directly by email details of the links needed to access all of the sessions this week. So if you have any queries about getting signed in, then please do contact our events team and they'll look after you. As well as the main daytime sessions, we're also running KE After Dark at seven o'clock. And these sessions are a chance for an informal catch up at the end of the day. Tamsin, Alistair and I will reflect on what's been discussed during the day's conference and highlight sessions that you may have missed. This is also another chance to connect with other delegates and share your own reflections on the day. And we've purposely scheduled these sessions for the evening so that those of you who may have struggled to attend sessions during the day, don't miss out. Think hay and coffee, but with after dinner mints or perhaps a glass of wine. And on Thursday evening, we're reviving our old school KE quiz. So stay tuned for more details of how you join us for that. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to Sean Fielding, who is Practice Oral Chair, based in the Southwest. Exeter, are you with us? Hello Maxine, uh, the, the Exeter delegates are alive and well um, and, um, and I'm hoping that we'll hear a little bit of our seagulls later on uh, during, during this morning. Um, you'll see that uh, in, in honour of this grand occasion I've decided to wear my suit and, uh, and I, I, it's the first time I have worn it for uh, about eight and a half months and um, it's been a year I think that none of us were expecting really not least all of those people who wrote those um, future looking reports about 10 years ago, snappily entitled 2020 Vision. Uh, not one of them at that point said that the crucial drivers of the new knowledge economy would be nurses, homeschooling, kitchen tables, garden sheds, and, and definitely none of them said knowledge exchange professionals would be key to the future. But during the course of our pandemic year, Knowledge exchange has come under the spotlight as never before with the 2.4% R&D target, the industrial strategy that puts KE people, our community and our ideas at the heart of economic and social innovation. The R&D roadmap with its focus on uh, civic and social role of universities and the, and, and I suppose more important than, than ever, that need for universities to demonstrate the impact of the public funding that we receive. And the magnificent response of universities and KE professionals to the pandemic has been inspiring and humbling. And we'll hear some of this story over this week of, of celebrations. It's very true that expectations are high and universities are being called on to help rebuild and renew our economy, society and our cultural institutions. 
and, and also with the pressure on the public finances that will come from the pandemic and Brexit, I think that our community will be called on more than ever to fill the gap. And at Praxis Oral, we've continued to build strong links this year with policymakers and national and international players and our involvement in the KE Concordat, the HEBSI Review and the uh, University Innovation Fund Review in Scotland will probably have an impact for years to come. And we also help drive a global definition of the profession uh, with all of the other knowledge exchange organisations around the world. And we've welcomed many more RTTP members to our community this year. We continue to work closely with key stakeholder organisations and uh, trying to find new ways of collaborating for the benefit of the sector as a whole. And our partner partnership with JISC is just one such a collaboration and we'll hear more about this in a moment. We're also working with the KE team at UK and Guild HE. We're involved with a number of their deep dives into key aspects of the economy. Later this year, we're planning to convene a group of Praxis Oral member directors to work with us to think through how to support the implementation of the KE Concordat. And the directors group will be called on for more advice over the course of next year. The experience of this pandemic year means that the way Praxis Oral serves our community has changed and will continue to change. During this year, we've had a number of firsts. Our first online awards event at the poster is, uh, is there. Um, and our first shed talks, and I am still in my shed here, although I have had to uh, put a bit more insulation on the walls. So it doesn't look quite as rustic as it did before. But that's you know, that's progress for you. And, um, uh, and our KE and coffee and our first digital courses um, uh, that we've, we've run so far and we've established an online community and now this digital conference. And we're pretty sure the future will be a hybrid offering, a more flexible and modular approach based on the needs of individuals. Um, and I suspect their teams um, in their in, in their organisations and their offices, and it will be both digital and face to face. Uh, we think that there will be entirely new ways of learning uh, together and sharing experiences with our colleagues around the world. The opportunity of um, of working together in this remote way means that all of those people that we used to have to go and visit are just there at the press of a button. Our schedule for 2021 is, um, is moving through at the moment in transition. It's gonna be mostly digital, although we are hopeful, thanks to um, vaccines developed uh, at our universities of at least some small face-to-face -face groupings um, later on in, in 2021. So there are many opportunities ahead, I think, but also uh, many challenges for KE leadership and therefore, Later on in 2021, there'll be a major new course uh, we're uh, launching to support the development of the next generation of KE leaders. It's not just about having the skills to develop and deliver institutional KE strategy, but also about influencing, influencing the future of KE policy. And that builds on the, all the work that uh, Trevor McMillan did in his review in, uh, in 2016, which identified the need for university leadership to drive successful and sustainable knowledge exchange across um, higher education institutions. And, and that in turn led to the KE Concordat, which then took it one step further and asked governing bodies to instill a culture in universities in, in higher education institutions that incentivizes and supports KE um, so that it is seen as equal to teaching and research. Um, and that's a really important development and we'll be supporting that um, uh, during the course of, uh, of next year. This will be my, uh, my last conference as chair um, and I'll be handing over to Ian Thomas from Cambridge Enterprise in January. And it's been a great privilege to work with so many talented people on behalf of, uh, of this community in the UK and indeed to be part of the global community where the UK uh, organization Praxis Oral is, 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 is globally respected as one of the leading uh, associations in the world. That this pandemic has been a real definer of character and grit and I know that the KE profession has risen to the challenge and I'm very proud to be uh, part of that. 
if you get the chance, um, listen to the interviews that Jeff Skinner put together, um, showing the secrets of the people who won the KE Awards earlier this year. Uh, I'd like to congratulate all those winners on their successes. They were brilliant examples of the work that people are doing in our, in our business all the time. Um, so I'd like to congratulate them, but also thank Jeff for taking the time to record their secrets so we can all share in them. And I think they'll be available on our online community soon if they're not already there. Um, certainly uh, very soon, I think. Um, of course, we do rely heavily on volunteers to support Praxis Oral, and I'd like to thank our volunteers for all their efforts behind the scenes to transform um, the programmes that we've been offering uh, so that they're fit for a digital future. Uh, and all of them were doing this in spite of the immense pressure that they've been under in, in their own day jobs. And I think all of us would say that this has been one of the busiest periods that we've had in this, um, in this community. Um, and uh, and that the fact that they've done that work on top of the, their day jobs is just fantastic. I'd also like to thank members um, for all of their contributions to this week's celebration. There are so many speakers and people um, making contributions. It's real evidence of the amazing and innovative work of the KE sector. And of course, the next generation of volunteer practitioners uh, will decide what the practice are all um, offer will look like in future and we'll help to deliver it and if you think you could make a contribution to your profession please get in touch um, uh, with the team. And finally I wanted to thank the team, the Praxis Oral team, uh, the executive team and all the, um, uh, and, and all the people who've helped uh, for navigating an unprecedented year to ensure that KE practitioners can connect as a community um, and, um, and, and learn and, uh, and improve uh, based on, on the experiences of others. And, and a special thanks to the Praxis Oral Events team for making us all look good online. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Christian Evans, who's the Director of Public Sector and Industry Research for JISC, who are the generous supporting sponsor of this week's event. Uh, which has provided us with an exceptional opportunity to pilot a new approach to connecting our members online. And actually it turned out to be a great alignment with uh, JISC objectives. Um, uh, we're a fellow not-for-profit organization that already serves our, um, uh, serves, serves our university community, um, but often in ways that the KE sector may not be aware of. And um, Christian is going to do something about that in the next few minutes and make sure you all know more about what uh, JISC is all about. But Christian, thank you very much indeed. And over to you. Thanks, Sean. And thanks, Maxi. Um, I really have appreciated your time. Um, you've both been really kind over the last uh, year or so, helping with my understanding, understanding of, uh, of KE. Um, my thanks also to Maxine and the team uh, for the support for this week and for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so good morning, or maybe um, as Maxine alluded to, good afternoon or good evening, depending upon when you're watching this. Um, hope you're all well and sitting comfortably. I hope you have a warm drink in hand. And if you're watching or listening to a recording, maybe you have something else to enjoy, uh, maybe a glass of wine. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome you to Knowledge Exchange Matters. JISC is proud to be a sponsor and to be working with Praxis as a membership uh, organization, we serve many of the same people and institutions, as uh, Sean said. Uh, my name is Christian Evans and I work for JISC. JISC is in the main a taxpayer funded, not for profit social enterprise. At JISC, our purpose is technology for good. Our core belief is that education and research improves lives, and technology improves education and research. Our vision is for the UK to be world leaders in technology for education and research. It's our mission to power and empower our members with the digital technology and data they need to succeed. While I was preparing for today, my daughter Skye was asking for some help with a speech she has to give at School for English. In talking to her, I explained I too had to do something similar, but I'd be presenting the people involved in research and knowledge exchange. Skylar, in a typical teenage fashion, looked at me quizzically and said, why you? I've never really figured out what it is you do. That set my mind to thinking, gosh, how did I arrive at this moment? What led me to this point in time? And of course, what could I possibly say that would be of interest? Especially when I was told, preferably no slides. I love a good picture of 50. 
I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. My parents are born in the 50s, working class people, but academically inclined, who have become educators. Looking back while considering today and my career so far, I wondered maybe was I always destined to be involved in education and research? Some of you will remember a time when knowledge was largely imparted by your parents, teachers, and the people around you. And some of you will remember receiving the Encyclopedia Britannica for birthdays or Christmases. Although I do remember getting a Pac-Man one year and a ZX Spectrum computer. My father instilled in me, whether I wanted to learn or not, a love of art, sport, literature, and cinema. My grandmother had managed a cinema. I remember being particularly pleased at the age of 10 to be taken to see a Japanese film called Kagamusha, three hours long and in Japanese, which you can imagine was not thrilling to me at the time. My mother through play, literature, music and theatre provided me with education in these and other skills. Some of you may remember going to the library or going to the museum, which for me and my mum was a weekly event. One of the people who sparked my interest as a child and continues to interest me was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was fascinated by life and the world around him, researching everything that got his attention. He is remembered for painting the Mona Lisa. However, when asked his profession, he considered himself an engineer, an inventor, and painter wasn't near the top of his list. Many of the technological advances that are commonplace now he imagined nearly 500 years ago. I aspire to live in Florence one day when Leonardo lived and highly recommend it if you get the chance to visit. In preparing for today, I was thinking and remembering all the people, my parents, family, friends and teachers who helped educate me. I would invite you at some point today to take 30 seconds to remember and give thanks to all the wonderful people who have supported you in your journey. As a teenager in Thatcher's 80s, I aspired to be a yuppie, I know the fight of fact, some of you may remember that. Getting into sales seemed like a good route to this. I had learning difficulties at school and struggled with the lack of challenging and interesting subjects. Why were we learning about Christianity? I wanted to learn about Zen Buddhism. While I had various jobs in telecommunications, including stints in global banking and construction, I found what I can now see was my area of interest or my calling. And while it still involved sales, it wasn't going to make me rich, but it was meaningful to me. I joined BT and after a couple of promotions, joined BT Education Research. I spent time with colleges and universities, with the then newly formed Welsh Assembly and with the DfE on technology solutions to enable education, teaching and research. I worked with researchers, innovators and inventors at BT's facilities at Marcelsham near Ipswich which is quite a long journey from Bristol, on new areas like the internet, video conferencing, and virtual learning environments. It's truly remarkable to see how things have changed and how we've progressed. This week's digital conference is a great example. I left BT and worked for a company called Worldcom on Superjanet 4 and with the customer Ukerna, United Education and Research Networking Association. I spent three challenging but interesting years working with the people at Ukona on Superjanet 4, the UK's backbone research and education network. Connecting every publicly funded research facility, university, college and school to each other and to the internet and to the global network of education and research. At the start, this was a whopping 2.5 gigabit, gigabits, which was increased to 10 gigabits, which was huge or so we thought at the time. The Janet network now runs at 600 gigabits. We even cash Netflix on the Janet network, which is all part of the student experience, of course. It was at this time that I got to work with Vint Cerf, one of the pioneers and legends of the internet. I remember us trying to figure out how we could embed waterproof screens into surfboards and connect back to Wi-Fi on the beach while in the car one day traveling to an event. This is way before iPads, iPhones, and touchscreen technology. I worked for Polycom, a video and audio encompassing manufacturer, working across the UK and Europe, evangelizing about the value of video to enable education and knowledge exchange, providing a means to offer lessons and study in fields where there was no local provision, 
and offering students the opportunity to collaborate internationally and to interact with inspirational people like the astronauts at NASA, the engineers at CERN, the rangers at Yellowstone National Park, who were all fantastic in imparting their knowledge and experience. After 25 years of working to support and enable education, research and knowledge exchange through the use of technology, I turned gamekeeper and realized a long held aspiration to work at GISC. I'm proud to work at GISC. I'm passionate about what GISC helps to enable. I enjoy what I do in the main because of the interesting people I get to work with and the diverse projects we help to enable. My colleague Caitlin, who's been working with Maxine on our relationship with Praxis on our sponsorship and contribution to the week's program, knows I can wax lyrical all day about GISC. I will try and keep it brief today. We have around 1,000 uh, amazing and knowledgeable colleagues at GISC with the same shared core belief that technology can enable education and research, that KE matters. We're working at a very interesting time in the infancy of machine learning, IoT, quantum computing, 5 and 6G, AI, blockchain, cloud computing, and big data. All areas we're involved with, I'm fascinated with the potential these technologies have to enable education and research. If you ever needed to reinforce the importance of research, the last year is proof absolute with the recent news on the vaccines for COVID. During the pandemic, we've been working to support institutions involved in genomics and pharma. We've ensured and assured exponential increases in data networking capabilities. Operations which normally take months and doing them in days and hours. We supported the Nightingale hospitals with access to Edurone. We've worked with the universities and colleges to help them adapt to the shift from campus to home, optimizing cloud and providing remote education through the use of technology. Assisting international students having to return home, access to learning remotely to ensure their experience and education but also to ensure our members retain their students. We also enable collaborations through technology with private research companies. We've been doing this for a number of years, but it seems we haven't been great at telling the community, and we're here for this purpose too. We work across all research areas, and in a, as an illustration, we've been supporting a collaboration between member institutions in the UK and with our NREN partners in the US and Switzerland. Together, we've been helping a global agritech company with a data project involving universities. Using IoT to monitor environmental conditions, connected to remote farming equipment and harvesters around the world, with the outcome of maximizing future global crop yields. So why is GISC working with Praxis and sponsoring Knowledge Exchange Matters? While GISC is known to some in the community as the provider of Janet, the National Education and Research Network. For our management of Veggie Roam in the UK, a universal Wi Fi single sign on, giving researchers, academics, and students the ability to automatically connect to Wi Fi wherever Veggie Roam is broadcast. Licenses for access to digital research and academic papers and material through JISC Digital Resources, uh, about £60 million worth of these every year. Despite this, we still don't have a strong GISC brand awareness within the community. And we want you to know about us and ensure you know that we are here to help with the challenges you face and the outcomes you want to achieve. During the conference, colleagues of mine are going to share some insight into their practice within KE and research, and also to engage in conversation with you. Matthew will be talking about the EU landscape with Brexit in mind, and also on the research technology infrastructure. Victoria on the UK research strategy to which we have contributed and continue to support. Guy will talk about research and cybersecurity. And Colin will speak about cloud computing and its ability to, to enable research collaboration. And Caitlin will be co-chairing the session on Wednesday, Keep Calm and KE On. I want to end my time today, firstly, to thank you for being involved in Knowledge Exchange. I lost both my parents at a relatively young age to cancer, but the knowledge that led to their treatments brought me several extra years with them. I'm very grateful for those people involved in research 
who contributed to new treatments. The research is past and present who enabled that extra time. KE really does matter. I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful time with your loved ones, family and friends, especially after this year. I look forward to attending the sessions and speaking with some of you during the week. I hope you thoroughly enjoy this week of Knowledge Exchange Matters. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was that was a really valuable insight into the work of JISC. And as you say, you know, I think um, shows our community that JISC is much more than just Janet. Um, so um, thank you very much. And can I add my thanks too to Caitlin Boom at JISC, who's been brilliant at helping us to coordinate um, your participation in this event. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, as always, I'll see you online later for a Shed Talk uh, with Felicity Birch. Um, so that's it from us for this first opening session. And um, we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible throughout the week. And um, thank you very much. Enjoy the week, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.